Good morning, Rochester Church of Christ. Hope you're having a wonderful Easter morning. Philip Rackney here. I'm just so thankful you're here to join us this morning as we gather as a church family. Even though we're separated, uh, we are together in our homes. Um, hopefully this morning will be a morning of encouragement for you in worship, encouragement in our message by Adam, and a time that we can commune together as a family. Miss you all dearly from, from my Brackney family to your homes. We miss you. We love you. We can't wait to gather again. Uh, but in the meantime, enjoy this morning as we gather remotely uh, to be encouraged. God bless. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above me, heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let earth and heavenly saints proclaim the power and might of His great name. Let us sing the song on bended knee. Praise God, the Holy Trinity. Praise to the King, His throne transcends. His crown and kingdom never end. Now and throughout eternity. I'll praise the one who died for has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed the victory is won he is risen from the dead and I will rise when he calls my name no more sorrow no I will rise on eagles' wings before my God, fall on my knees and rise. I will rise, and I hear the voice of many angels sing, worthy This Easter morning, my prayer is that we will find hope, hope in the one, the one who has risen from the grave, the one who has overcome death, the one who has taken upon him the sins of the world. 
In our world right now, we are surrounded by numbers, statistics, graphics, messages that tell us that it's a lot of darkness out there. The death numbers are rising. But there is one who is resurrected. This morning, I hope that you are blessed by a song that Josh Stewart will perform for us called Living Hope. It's in Jesus that we have our hope. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living. could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to bear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my Lord.
Good morning, church, and happy Easter. Join me today in John chapter 20 as we talk about how love has defeated death. It says in verse 1, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. One of the things that always fascinates me is the silent space that exists between the end of chapter 19, when the tomb is very, very full, and the beginning of chapter 20, when the tomb is empty. Something happened between those, but we don't hear about it. One of my favorite preachers, Frederick Beekner, comments on this, and he says it this way. He says, it's always struck me as remarkable that when the writers of the four gospels come to the most important part of the story they have to tell, they tell it in whispers. The part he means, of course, is the part about the resurrection, that Jesus, who was dead, isn't dead anymore, that he's risen, that he's here. That, that and, and according to the Gospels, there was no choir of angels that sang about it, and there was no sudden explosion of light in the sky to direct us to it. Instead, not a single soul is there to see it. John 19 ends with, the body of Jesus being placed in a garden tomb because uh, the, the folks that are doing it need to leave because the day of preparation is here and, and, and it's time to get home for Sabbath. The disciples uh, that are there are tearfully scrambling to get home for Sabbath. And that's kind of silly, right? After all, the Messiah is dead. The 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 liberator, the, the anointed one, the, the savior is dead. And now I'm supposed to go home and light some candles and rest? And why are we resting? The, the son of God was executed on the basis of some lies told by some religious officials. And now I'm supposed to go home and I'm supposed to obey God's rules about Sabbath? They just killed God's son. And, and, and Jesus healed on the Sabbath and he worked on the Sabbath. And when they kill him, I can't do anything about it because it's Sabbath. What am I supposed to do? Just come here and wait? Yeah. And it turns out the waiting is the hardest part, isn't it? That I, I think that the longest day in the history of the world was the Saturday after the, after the crucifixion of Jesus. Because that's when all of heaven and all of earth waits. God didn't take action. God didn't step in. God didn't do anything. Are you awake up there? Didn't you see what just happened? Aren't you going to do something? Don't you have to do something? Where are you? The truth be told, waiting on God is murder on a soul. Mary knows because she's decided she's done waiting. It says here that, that before a stone, but before it was even light, it was still dark, she's running out to the tomb. And she's going to go see for herself what's happened. And when she gets there and she sees that the stone's been rolled away, 
She thinks the body's been taken. And that's a pretty natural uh, way of explaining what could have happened. After all, resurrection isn't natural. You see, we get so used to it because we're used to Easter after Easter after Easter of he is risen. He's risen indeed, right? And we're, we're used to the idea of Jesus, the resurrected Lord. But for them, resurrection is supernatural. Resurrection is not normal. And maybe, just maybe, it's harder to see than we think it is. It's harder to believe than we like to claim it is. Maybe what John is saying is that you can't see it unless you're shown the way by the resurrected one. Because that seems to be the point of what's happening here. Mary runs off and she tells John and she tells Peter what she's seen. They immediately run to the empty tomb. It says they look. It says John says he believes, but at the same time, it ends in verse 9 by saying they still didn't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. But here we have Mary crying before the tomb. Look at, look at verse 11. It says, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? And she says, They've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've put him. She's crying. She looks in. There's the angels. They look at her, and they say, Why are you crying? And she says, Well, I, I think I've lost Jesus. And phew, trust me, she would not be the last disciple to lose Jesus somewhere in his tomb. But then it gets really interesting in, in verse 14. Okay, and, and don't, don't worry about the angels. Their part's over. Now it gets really interesting. Watch this. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize it was Jesus. She sees him, but doesn't realize it's him. Look at this. He even talks to her in verse 15. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And thinking he was the gardener. She says, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I'll get him. Rob Bell has this great line about how much of a bummer it must have been to have come back from the dead, only to be confused for the gardener. But even there, I wonder if there's not something else going on. If there's not, not some kind of interesting business happening here, if you think about it, because this is, after all, John's gospel, and, and John is known for being uh, fascinatingly written because John has all kinds of symbols everywhere. Now think about it. John likes, for instance, for instance, John likes the number seven, right? So, for instance, John's gospel is the gospel that has Jesus giving the seven I am statements, Right? The, the, I'm the bread of life. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the resurrection. Right? He gives the seven I am statements. And those are designed to point to the fact that Jesus is, in fact, God, the great I am. John also has seven signs that if you count the miracles in John, Jesus does seven signs that are designed to make the same point that Jesus is, in fact, God. So in John 2, he turns water to wine. And in John 4, he heals the official's son. And in, in John 5, he heals the paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda. And in John 6, he feeds the 5,000 and then he walks on water. And in John 9, he heals the man born blind. And then in John 11, he resurrects Lazarus. You see the signs escalate in scope and in significance. And they culminate in the resurrection of a dead man from the grave. Seven signs. Seven I am statements. Seven would have caught people's attention, especially the early Jews that were reading it. Because they would be familiar with another story about sevens. For us, seven is a biblical number. It sounds like something that gets used in the Bible a lot. We've probably been told somewhere it's a perfect number. But for Jews reading this, they would have recognized that number seven as having direct significance with the creation story. How in seven days, God made the world. 
in these seven signs, think about the problems we see. Privation, sick children, lifetimes of pain, starvation, storms, blindness, and to sum it all up, here is it as is its root, death. You see, the old creation had a problem. It had a death problem. And Bell says when we come to the resurrection of Jesus in John 20, we get an eighth sign. We get a new sign for a new day, an eighth day. And if the seven days before referred to the first week of creation, then the eighth day refers to the first day of new creation. If the old creation had a death problem, the new creation doesn't. And with an empty tomb as witness, death is defeated, and Jesus calls us to witness faithfully the victory of love. And here we meet Mary Magdalene, who's thinking that he's the gardener. And maybe that should be said with a wink, too. Because after all, God likes gardens. God likes being a gardener. God likes to put gardens in his new creations, doesn't he? You see, the first garden was amazing. Adam and Eve lived in it and they worked in it and they, and they, and they cared for the garden. They, and God was there with them and they would walk. The, can you just imagine they would go on strolls together? Hey, look, there's the tree of life. Yeah, there it is. And then with just one temptation, one audacious lie that somehow in the middle of that perfection, Satan convinced them it could be better. And they believed him. They ate. And their eyes were opened. And shame took over. And fear seized control. Sin entered and the old creation broke under the weight of its death problem. So as Paul describes in Romans 8, Romans 8, 19 and 22, the creation is groaning in agony because of this death problem. Now, when John talks about the way it all ends, this, this, the way the old creation passes and the new creation comes, I want you to look at the way he describes it. It's in Revelation chapter 21. It says there, <clears throat> starting in verse one, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he'll wipe every tear from their eyes. And there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. New heaven, new earth, new creation, new city, the world set to rights, the world the way it should be. God is dwelling among his people again. There's no more pain and there's no more death because the old creation is gone. The new creation is here. I am making all things new. Then follow with the way he describes the new city in chapter 22. It says, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They'll see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and there'll be no more night. They won't need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. The new Eden the new garden is in this city. And did you see the tree of life was there? 
and the leaves are for the healing of the nations. Please, God, bring healing to the nations. There's no more curse. There's no more night. The lamb is our light, but it's a garden. She confused him with the gardener. And it's kind of what he is. It says in John 20, in verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. He calls her name, Mary. She turned towards him. And she finally sees him. And so she cries out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. She reaches for him. It says, it, says, it says that she reaches for him, but he says, do not hold on to me for I've not yet ascended to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I've seen the Lord she told them that she that he had said these things to her. She reaches out for him. She calls her old name for him, but it's just not going to do because Mary doesn't realize that she can't hold on to him. She can't hold on to who he was. This is new. Creation is new. Resurrection is new. Mary, you are new. Behold, I'm making all things new. Another one of my favorite preachers, Barbara Brown Taylor, says this. She says, new life given by God can't be killed. And we can remember that then there is nothing we cannot do. Move mountains. Banish fear, love our enemies, change the world. The only thing we cannot do is hold on to Jesus. Instead, we must let him take us where he's going, into the white hot presence of God, who is not behind us, but ahead of us every step of the way. God is making all things new. The Apostle Paul, in one of the richest proclamations of the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, uses of all things gardening imagery. Wouldn't John be proud to explain the significance of Christ's resurrection? In 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 26, he says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He's the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, the first man was very strong. So in Christ, all will be made alive, but the second man is even stronger. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. And then the end will come, Paul writes when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he's destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. Now pay attention to verse 26. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. You see, God is the God of life. And life will have the last word triumphing over death. Because after evil has done its worst, and after sin has done everything it can, and it looks at Jesus' body on the cross and says, he is dead. In the silent space, when no one else can see, God speaks once more and reminds the universe that he is risen. He is risen indeed. And with an empty tomb as witness, death is defeated. And Jesus calls us to witness faithfully to the victory of love.
Happy Easter from the Hinegers. I hope that you all are having a wonderful day. Uh, we are just so blessed to be a part of this congregation. And we're excited to share some thoughts with you uh, this morning for our time of communion. I never in a million years would have imagined we'd be in this kind of situation celebrating Easter, but this is where we're at. So I have some questions to ask my children. Hey kids, can you tell me something that has been difficult and hard about this separation time and time in quarantine? Um, probably not seeing any of my friends or like talking to any of them. And like the only friends that I could talk to is like the ones I have on the street. But other than that, like I can't really talk to any of my school friends. Right. Ready? Um, I'd probably say the same thing as Elijah. Yeah. Fortunately, we have some friends on our street, huh? Evangeline? Um, I really miss, like, having, like, play dates with my friends and, like, going places. And we don't get to do that in quarantine. We can't, like, leave the house as much. Right. Sadie? Um, I have been missing my friends at school and church and the ones down the street to camp to the Easter egg hunt outside with us. Right. So there's been a lot of things that have been hard. I know we tend to be a bit more on the extroverted side in our family and we miss being around people, especially but you know, we've also found some things that have been really good from this time. Kids, do you want to share some things that even that have been first? good? Sadie, yes, you can go first. Um, that we spend more time with our family and we um, don't get sick from the coronavirus and we can have an Easter with no one else doing some accidentally stealing one of the eggs when we put it down. <laughs> oh, there's that, yes. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Elijah, what about you? Um, uh, well, probably like the bonding time and, uh, well, probably uh, like all this time together, we learn more stuff about each other. Right. I Especially you also enjoy sleeping in yes. and not waking up at 6 a.m. for school. That's been nice, too. Yes. Brody? Mm. Anything you want to add? Um, probably oh. that we get to spend more time with our family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Running? Evangeline? I like spending more time with our family and usual. Uh, usually, uh, before quarantine, we when we like ask to play with someone they just didn't want to but now if we ask they do because we don't really have enough we we have enough time to play with them you mean your siblings yeah yeah <laughs> that's been nice so there's been some good that has come along with the bad and we also miss school <laughs> in the high map yeah. <laughs> she really misses hard math, apparently. I better I step up my... I not like that hard math. Oh, I miss oh. drawing. <laughs> oh, that's a good thing. Okay. I forgot to say... Uh, Go ahead. I forgot uh, when when it was hard in quarantine, I forgot to say that I had to miss school. Oh, I know, because you really love school. So there's, there's good and there's bad. Okay. So when I think about communion, which is what we're doing now, I... You know, you can't help but think about Jesus' death on the cross. And I can't think of anything that is harder than that. Not quarantine, coronavirus, anything. That is, for me, like, that must be the hardest thing ever in the world. And Jesus went through that. And so, with that hard thing also came good things, too, right? We get to celebrate. We get to be with each other in church. And we get to um, hopefully spend eternity in heaven someday. So I'm going to share with you some scripture from Romans 8. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself <clears throat> has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, 
and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. <clears throat> Can anything, anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons. And listen to this part, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are together in this, but we are also separate, and that separation can feel overwhelming and scary. And I hope that you will go back to Romans 8 and remember that nothing can separate us from God's love right now. God is with us always. And we look forward to being with you all as our church family again, as soon as we can. Let's pray. God, I thank you for um, your son. I thank you for his death and resurrection. And God, today on, on this day that we get to celebrate his resurrection, God, we thank you for the new life that we, uh, we are brought into. God, that we can participate in that as uh, the world is called into relationship with you. And God, even though we uh, are not together, God, that tomb is empty and we celebrate that resurrection this morning. And God, help us to be a people that celebrates that resurrection every day. We pray, Father, that you would bless uh, the bread and the cup as we partake this morning. And we pray all these things, your son's holy name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Happy Easter. Good morning to my brothers and sisters in Christ. Today is Easter Sunday, and it's not exactly the program that was being planned a couple of months ago. It's been just over a month since your shepherds made the difficult decision to temporarily suspend our church family's meeting together at 250 Avon because of the COVID-19 virus. Now today, as we celebrate Easter Sunday at home with our families, I'm sure we all look forward to the day when we can come together, not only in spirit and love, but also in person. But until that time comes, we are grateful that the technology enables us to continue to worship and fellowship and encourage one another to share communion from our houses and to praise God for his love and his grace. Your shepherds are pleased to share that our church family's giving was on target for the month of March. That's really astounding under the circumstances. It's in line with what was planned long before the COVID crisis began. That's a testimony to your faith in Jesus, to your love for the lost, and your commitment to the work of this church, both in our community and beyond. We sincerely thank you for continuing on mission and ministry through your giving and through your service to others. Perhaps some of you are unaware that you have the ability to make your offerings online digitally, either regularly or during this period when we're unable to gather together on Sunday at our building. If you would like to make use of this option, you can log on to the Rochester Church website at www.rochestercoc.org, select Click to Donate, and then follow the prompts on the screen. It is an easy way to contribute monetarily to continue the outreach and missions we support, both now and on an ongoing basis. Now, until the day when we once again assemble together as a church family, May the Lord bless and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Amen.
Good Easter morning, and thank you so much for joining us today. Wanted to let you know that signups are available on our website for the prayer and fasting that will happen tomorrow. Please make sure to go on and sign up for your time slot and to remember that we are all praying together uh, during this uncertain time. We also wanted to let you know that our remaining gatherings for April and all events have been canceled at this time. And as we know more information, we'll make sure to communicate that to all of you. Also wanted to let you know that we've created an email address for special needs, and that could be anything from a need that you have for you and your family, or a Bible study, or a prayer request. All that information and requests can be made through respond at rochestercoc.org. And finally, our ministry partner, Micah Six, has been collecting cleaning supplies for residents and people in Pontiac that just don't have access to that. To find out how you can help and how you can contribute cleaning supplies, you can go to our website under the important information tab, or you can go there directly by going to rochestercoc.org slash cleaning. Church, it's been a great day to celebrate, and we can't wait to when we all come back to 250 West Avon and be able to celebrate together. Because when we do, we are going to have an Easter celebration that day. No matter what time of year it is, we can always celebrate together. Because at the end of the day, and at the end of time, we know that we have a Savior who has risen. Amen? Have a great day, and God bless you. Happy Easter to you all. Good morning, everyone, and happy Easter, especially to our friends, family, and kids. Our little friend here just wanted to say he hopes you have a great day.